uh, from the Seven Hells podcast. Oh, my, man, my awards would have been so heavy. I would have had to rent an extra plane. <laughs> <laughs> like, it was Rosario Dawson. Dan is a douchebag. You know nothing, douchebag. I, I didn't watch any of the trailers. I just, I generally don't like it. Well, then you should trailer. definitely be on a show about Game of Thrones. <laughs> you get off on it. I would like to see you, Jim Chadman, nude again. But I will be butt fucking mad on every episode of the show. That's it. Seven Hells. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to Honey Radio. This is episode number 15. Now, we are here with a very special guest who has been a, a bit of our digital friend for a little while now, and it's very nice to talk to him in person. But uh, first things first, we're going to introduce the honeys who are with me here tonight. I have the Revenge Honey, Linny. Hi. And the Sci-Fi Honey, Jen. Hello. And uh, we have our producer, Honey, Matt. Who is lovely, and we love him. Thank you so much for being here with us. Matt is from the Wicked Radio Network and from the Dead Men Talking podcast, and he's like our babysitter when it comes to live shows. So once again, we are live on Radio Fubar. That is www.radiofubar.com. We are live every Sunday night at 5 p.m. PST, because PST is the only one that matters, because that's where I am. Hey. <laughs> love you. Um, so let's get to this. So our guest tonight is Mr. Kurt Larson. He is the writer, director, and an actor in a lovely little indie film called Son of Ghost Man. Um, he is also the host of the Stay Cool Geek podcast, which you can find through his website. Hello, Kurt. Hey, how's everyone doing today? Awesome. How are you? I'm great. I, I'm just not sci-fi honey's throwing me off. I know her only as Nemesis Honey. <laughs> So right off the bat, I'm really thrown, you know, now there's a producer, honey. I'm confused, but I'm excited to be here. We like to keep our guests guessing. Excellent. Well, thank you for having me on. I really enjoy everything you girls do. And and you, sir, as well, producer, honey. <laughs> he has to be quiet because he's not allowed to talk. I like that. That's similar to my marriage. So we're right on the same wavelength right out of the get-go. <laughs> It's equal opportunity for us. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks for having me on. <laughs> oh, we're really stoked to have you here. So, um, Son of Ghost Men, we kind of discovered a bunch of months ago, I think when you first put it out, around October. Mm -hmm. Am I right? You were, you were one of the first, in fact. <gasps> like, re seriously, like, possibly the first uh, person I didn't know that, that, that discovered it oh, on no. this level. So you were, like, super fresh on the criticism, too. Oh, yeah. I mean, I remember tweeting you, Kat, because I had been following you guys, you know, and I, I found you pretty funny and interesting. And I was like, oh, man, these they're going to hate a romantic comedy. This is where I'm going. Because I'm into, you know, getting beat up. So I was like, and you were so nice to respond. And I appreciated how upfront you were when you wrote me back. You were like, man, I'm just going to warn you. I hate these things. So are you sure you want to do this? And I probably had a couple cocktails at that point and that I just wanted to get the film out there. I'm like, yeah, go for it. You know, I'm okay with that. That is so, so yeah. that's so brave. <laughs> yeah. And we, I've, I, I, you, your entertainment value has kept me even to this day. I still follow you. So. Aww, I'm glad you still love us, even though we were kind of mean. I, well, you we know, were, I don't we think were really so. Mean. Not really. We I mean, mean not all of us were mean. No, no, not all of us were mean. You know, it's tough being the one lone woman on an island. <laughs> all the well, my exact words were "God damn you for being so fucking cute." So <laughs> that's my lead. It's definitely not me. <laughs> I, I tried to. I tried to be a little tough, but that was yeah, no, it was great. You know, I'm I'm one of those guys who's who's a little different. I'm all I'm open to all that. You know, it's all subjective, and I'm I'm grateful for anyone that that checks out my work. It doesn't matter on any side of the fence. You know. Well, for those for those listening at home who haven't seen Son of Ghost Men, which is, I'm assuming, way more people than should have seen it, can you give us a little synopsis? Sure. It's story? basically, it's about a guy in his 30s who's a little lost in life, and his his hero was an old horror host uh, named Ghost Man, and one night he, you know, he's in a fit of depression, and he throws on some monster makeup and films this video, lo and behold, it goes on the internet, goes viral, and he's got to figure out his life while at the same time he's fallen in, I mean, I don't think he's fallen in love, but he's falling for a new woman on the block. So he's kind of keeping his identity hidden from her and at the same time doing this horror hosting. And really, for me, it's, it's not just about a horror host. It's about anyone that does anything creative, you know, present company included, that 
it might not pay the bills, you might not be famous, but you still do it because you love it. So to me, that's what the film's really about. Cool. That is an excellent synopsis. <laughs> so, and that actually leads me into my first question. Um, I'm sure you get asked this all the time, but what made you want to write Son of Ghost Man? Um, from the narrative perspective, I, when I grew up in Chicago, the suburbs, my horror host was a guy named Son of Sven Gulli, who is now just Sven Gulli, and you can actually find him on Me TV. It's in like 90% of the country, so it's a big nation, national show. He was my guy when I was a little kid, and quite frankly, my parents worked, you know, like 60 hours a week. I didn't get to see that much, and I had an older brother. We had a seven-year age gap. That's a pretty big deal when, you know, he's 14 and I'm seven. You know, he's, he's stuck dealing with me. And the, one of the few things we had in common was Saturday afternoons watching this crazy guy with long hair, monster makeup, and he throws, like, rubber chickens at the camera. I mean, it's, it's a really unique entertainment uh, aspect that I, I was connected to, like, immediately, even as a small kid. And I always thought, oh, that's just a really interesting metaphor for, you know, I'm in my 30s and I have a lot of friends and colleagues who pursue the entertainment industry, and it's very difficult. And I thought, oh, what an interesting metaphor that the, we keep trying to do this, even though we haven't broken through, so to speak, on, on a certain level. And these guys do it as well. And, you know, I just thought it was so interesting, and I just wanted to really honor them. You know, and at the same time, honor my the things I want to do with, you know, movies and, and storytelling, which is tell sweet and charming stories. That's what I like to do. So right, right in line with a horror podcast. <laughs> Blood cuts and uh, romantic comedies. Well, you right. know, I think I think that uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm alone in this, or maybe I'm not. But I I think murder is a very personal thing, and it's <laughs> it can be a very intimate thing. So I think romance definitely has its place in horror. Well, yeah, I mean, and you know, all kidding aside, I I think that I'm not very adamant that <laughs> horror hosts are incredibly important historically to horror, the horror community, and to people who are into horror. There are thousands of people who are introduced to horror, like myself, because of a horror host. You know, if it wasn't for this guy running around on TV, Sven Gulli, I never would have discovered, you know, the universal monsters and the classic monsters. So mm -hmm. I, I really think they're really important. And horror isn't always about, you know, blood, guts, and gore, although that stuff no, is awesome. Um, I just think, you know, horror hosts are really important as well. I, I totally agree. I think that's, that's kind of how I got my start with it too was this show that was on when I was a kid it was um the hilarious house of Frankenstein. <laughs> sounds awesome it was fucking retarded this guy was a um he was a vampire but his face was green and he had awful hair and all they did was introduce cartoons and strange little things like that little spooky cartoons yeah but that's that's how I got turned on to that kind of stuff at a very young age well, and so, it's so interesting it. because even in the subculture of horror and then the subculture of horror hosts, you have really, it's, it's just like actors or whatnot. There's some guys that are amazing and some guys maybe not so amazing. And it's just so fascinating, you know, to see the different types. And I've been catching up on a lot of the newer guys and gals lately. And I mean, I'm blown away. I sit at my computer. And I'm like, look at this guy. Look at what he's doing. This is incredible. You know, it's so interesting and that it would compel someone to do that. You know, and I'm, I'm in line with them. I think it's just a beautiful entertainment form. Even at its worst, it's interesting. You're like, what is happening here? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I feel very, like, a very huge amount of kinship towards, like, Elvira and her character. Like, yeah. I would love to be like that someday. Right. And, I mean, she's probably the most famous one, you know, exactly. and, and still going strong and still making appearances. Yeah. And we just saw her at Knott's Halloween Haunt out here last mm -hmm. year and still packing them lines long. You oh, know? of course. It's, Was she in character or not? She was. She was totally in Ooh, character. Because I've heard that's way more expensive. It, it's, it's, you're exactly right. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's way more expensive, and you have to purchase a certain amount of memorabilia mm -hmm. to even get to meet her. So of it's, course. And I found that really interesting, too, because I, I'm from a geek background. So, you know, to see what she charges in comparison to, like, you know, um, famous people in movies from years past or even, you know, baseball players, because I like baseball. It's so interesting to me, but... You know, people people love her. She's she's one of a kind. There's no question. Absolutely. Um, so tell us about your horror host characters in Son of Ghost Man. Um, how how were they inspired by hosts like Sven Gulli and you know brought you were brought up with? Um, how did how did they kind of inspire the development of the two characters that you have? Well, there's a couple things. So Son of Ghost Man, that's the main guy, basically Denny. 
Uh, I loved the son of, I obviously got that from son of Sven Gulli. I was like, oh, it's so interesting that he would play somebody that thinks he's the son. And what I really wanted to do with uh, Devin Ordon, the, the actor, is I wanted him to be really awkward and uncomfortable as son of Ghost Man. So we talked a lot about, okay, I don't want you to do a voice, you know, because some of the actors would come in and do like this crazy voice, you know, and I was like, no, I don't want that. I want you to kind of kind of be who you would be as the, as the person, uh, Denny. And, you know, but you'd heighten certain things the way you talk. But then I want you to break character when you realize this is just a train wreck. Because I felt, you know, the audience would have more compassion and like that character more. Mm-hmm. And then on the flip side, uh, counter cool, I just was looking for the biggest douchebag possible. And, of course, <laughs> perfect casting for those of you who aren't aware. Um, I just wanted him to be like, you know, because vampires seem to be everywhere. And, you know, a lot of people roll their eyes at vampires or did. There was a small portion of time they're like, another vampire. And I thought, oh, that'd be, you know, let's go with that route because so many people will immediately, you know, recoil from this guy. And then I just wanted him to, to talk about how sexy he was when he's not. And he could, he's just, he's just gross. <laughs> and, and from there, I was like, he's got to sell something. Because I'd seen the documentary King of Kong, which if you've ever seen it, I <laughs> love that documentary. I, I, it's, it's about Donkey Kong nerds. And <laughs> Have you not heard of it? It's literally like no. a four star movie. You how have I, how have I heard of and watched Bronies, but not that? Oh my God, this is a real story. It really happened, and it's about oh. this really nice man who plays Donkey Kong and he wants to get the world record. And there's this other nefarious, I don't want to give it away, but this terrible guy who's like thwarting his very real attempts to beat the record. <laughs> and one of the things that's great about this guy, Billy Mitchell, is he sells in real life, I think it's like hot sauce. <laughs> so he's always pushing his product. And it just makes him even more of a D, of a D bag, and I was like, "Well, we've got to make Counter Cool sell something." And I just was like, "And this is a little bit peeking behind the curtain." I wanted to shoot as many scenes outside as possible to, you know, make up for what I felt was a, a lighting lack of experience. So I was like, "Well, vampires can't be outside. Everyone knows that, and because uh, the light, of course." And I was like, "Well, what if he sold uh, sunblock?" <laughs> You know, then he can go anywhere he wants and talk about how sexy it is because he has sunblock. And even better, he can, you know, tell people why they're not a why they can't be in the sun because they're not as cool as him. And so I felt if we did that, you would immediately like uh, Son of Ghost Man much more because he's awkward and he doesn't know what he's doing. And you would hate the other guy more, Counter Cool, because he's kind of famous, but he's terrible. I mean, he's like Dice Clay in the 90s. <laughs> or something. You're just like, really? This guy's popular? How is that possible? So that's kind of where the development, and it's just a natural rivalry between the two. That is a perfect explanation. Yeah. <laughs> and totally it's it's funny when people uh, will say to me, you know, like, they'll talk about the film, and I can tell what they want to say at one point, and they'll be like, yeah, man, I really, I really fucking hated Counter Cool. What a douchebag. I'm, I'm sorry about that. And I'm like, you're not offending me. You're, <laughs> you're, this is a compliment. So. <laughs> and Devin is just such a warm individual and easy to like. You know, I could never do uh, what he does as Danny McMurray. He's just so likable, you know, in my opinion. Yes, uh, he was he was quite well liked amongst the honeys as well. <laughs> do you remember our, our nickname for him? Um, it was, I, I'm not sure, but Bangable, bangable Leads, and you oh, called hi, him the James hi. Dean or something. Yes, it was, it was... so for those of you listening who don't know who James Dean is, um, it's spelled D-E-E-N, and you Google it right now, and then call me in a day. <laughs> I warned you, Bob. Listen. <laughs> I was showing my friend at uh, dinner the other night the tumbler, and his eyes just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. So Denny, Denny for us was definitely uh, yeah. He's he's the vanilla James Dean. He was just <laughs> so so likable and so warm and just so blisteringly hot. <clears throat> anyway, yeah. Um, no, and what was great was getting Devin, who is naturally like that, but getting him to play even dorkier than what he is in real life. I, I kept trying to tell him, I've told him often, I'm like, you don't need to play the cool guy in a movie. Don't do it. It's not, it's not your thing. Like, you're, you're much more appealing. Just, just dork it up a little, man. Trust me. <laughs> so we had those conversations. No one likes to hear time. that. No, no, no. You, you can't do the cool thing. Don't do the sexy thing. Just be a big doofus. You'll be fine. Well, especially with actors, everyone wants to be like, you know, uh, Gary Oldman or these these hardcore dark actors that we think of. And I'm like, yeah, but there's something to be said for, you know, Paul Rudd over there. He's amazing, you know? Uh, yes, um, also highly bangable. Paul. Paul. Yes. <laughs> and, and you get to play, actually, uh, usually a, a wider variety of, of, of range, 
You know what I mean? You can play dramatic. You can play light. You know, sometimes those other guys don't get those opportunities to play the light and the comedic. So Definitely. I just kept telling him, like, just just trust me on this dork stuff. I got it for you. Just let's go. <laughs> and we had code, too, because so I'm a big Star Wars nerd and a big comic book nerd. And he's not into any of that stuff, so he didn't really understand the, the background in it. But he's really into, like, music and, and, and the minutia of music. So we would go into a scene, and I, he'd be like, okay, so this scene. And I'd be like, okay, this scene is a little bit more REO Speedwagon. But, like, <laughs> not when they were popular, maybe, like, when they like, broke down a little bit, but still around. You know? so, and it would, I would swear on my life, it would work. He'd be like, uh, okay, I got it. And then he would nail it every time. A broke down REO Speedwagon. Like, is it Smashing Pumpkins here? I don't know. <laughs> like, I think it is, man. Oh my god, that's a very interesting way to go at it, for sure. <laughs> Look, anything you do to get through to an actor... I think the broke down Aria Speedwagon is going to stay with me, to be honest. <laughs> like the Aria Radio Flyer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so tell us about your relationship with um, romantic comedies. I know yeah, I've, I got, got, some I've got like a personal it. hater aid for John Hughes, but... It's, you do? I do, oh god. Really? Wow, and you still, wow, and you still liked it. Good, that's good. Here's the thing. Romantic comedies make people revolt, and I fully understand that. What angers me is not about – it's not people's feelings towards them. It's the fact that I believe studios have let it get to this level. Now, whether you like – I really feel that romantic comedies, just like horror, is a specific genre specific to those people. And when they're done right, I'm sure you watched a multitude of tremendously bad horror movies. Oh, you know? yeah. Oh, and, God. And what I think you're smart enough to realize is there's regular people that will no longer watch horror movies because of that specific aspect. They're like, oh, another horror movie? So because of the, the mass amount of, of poor um, movies in the horror genre, it turns regular people off to the horror genre, which ultimately hurts the whole genre because the more people that watch good ones brings about more fans, more movies, you know, better stuff. It's the same way with the romantic comedies. The, the fact of the matter is I believe – for the most part, Hollywood has kind of lost their way on what is a good romantic comedy and what isn't. It seems like they want to shoehorn some wacky plot device into every romantic comedy. And that's the kind of thing that, in my opinion, makes a lot of regular people roll their eyes and be like, do I really have to go see this movie that, you know, is about a guy and, and, and a girl, but they're I'm trying to stay away from certain movies to be nice. Just anything that uh, Adam Sandler's made recently? Yeah. Oh my god, I literally was thinking of the freak I like, just Drew saw. Drew Barrymore and Adam Sandler going on safari in Africa with their children and just magically showing up on the same African safari at the same time! <laughs> on my life, on everything, uh. I literally was trying to stay away from mentioning that. But you're exactly right. We, <laughs> we literally were watching, watching uh, we went and saw Captain America 2 in the theaters, packed theater. First yep. trailer comes up, it's that Africa, Adam Sandler movie. And I don't usually say anything loud at movies, but it's just, it's one of those things that I'm trying to like, don't be resentful. It's okay. But I looked at, you know, my five <laughs> friends and I'm like, hey, but I don't make a living in this business because I don't write that. <laughs> so, yep. To me, when they're done right, they have a very important value that, you know, especially for, you know, relationships. You know, there are a lot of, you know, to use generalizations, there are a lot of guys that don't want to watch romantic comedies. If they're done right and they do, it brings them closer to their mate and there's there's not that, you know, ultimately, I mean, I'm lucky my, my wife likes all the same stuff I do, so I don't have that problem. But if they're done right, if they're done, you know, in a way that doesn't make you roll your eyes too much because you got to have a little cheese in there, I do believe that, then I think they work. And then the other side of it is I felt like indie films, if they were doing romantic comedies, it seemed to me that every ending – there was no happy ending, but the character learned a lesson. Because to them, <laughs> that meant it was real. And you know what? That's not always the case. You're right. Sometimes it doesn't end up, end up well. But there are cases where it does end up well. You know, there are times people fall in love. There are times people get together. And let's face it, anyone that's been in a relationship, you know, the best, the magic comes in the beginning when you're starting to get to know each other and you're starting to fall for each other. It's the best part. So if you can do it right, to me, it, it's an important facet of the film industry. But I fully understand why people, if I say, hey, I made a rom-com, because that's what we're calling it now, mm -hmm. you know, they're just, they're like, oh, God, I can't do that. I'm like, just give it a chance. You know, I was very <laughs> specific not to give anything away, but my characters never say I love you. It never happens, because that would be insane. They've just met each other. They're just adults trying to figure stuff out. He's throwing on monster makeup, you know? He doesn't have time to say I love you. You know, it's more just like, let's see where this goes. So... <laughs> 
that that's in a, in a nutshell how I feel. And you know, I do love John Hughes. Um, certainly, early John Hughes, Breakfast Club, Sixteen Candles, um, and you know, Breakfast Club to this day is still kind of whatever you think about it. Most people look at it as you know the high school standard. You know, and that's kind of sad that we haven't had too many great high school movies since then. That you know, not just are great for a couple of years, but actually people are still watching them. Mm-hmm. And I think it says a lot about who he is. And of course, I like Cameron Crowe. That's probably, you know, one of my main idols. I think Say Anything is, you know, the greatest romantic comedy ever written. But that's me. So if you held up a boombox now, you'd be a stalker. But at the time, it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I got to say, if uh, John Cusack was standing outside of my window, that would be a very different thing being flying out, flying out of the window. That's <laughs> you sat. were with the Raven. Fuck you, bastard. <laughs> <laughs> He it, was the he the one? Is that he ruined the, the raven for me? But it's because he, he it's raven. because he can't Sorry shut his mouth. He can't he can't close his mouth. It bothers me. Um, <laughs> I understand. <laughs> I'm glad that you're so passionate about romantic comedies. I think that's I don't want to say it's very sweet, but it is. It's not a very popular stance. I can tell. Definitely you that. not. So thank you for coming onto a horror podcast and and sharing that. Yeah, man. I mean, like I said, <laughs> I'm pretty reasonable. I think almost all genres of film are important if they're done right. You know and a lot of there's a lot of muck and drudge out there that isn't done right. So, you know, I'm hoping to do my best to to show people that you can still make these films and not have you know anyone but the Green Goblin roll their eyes too much and you'll be <laughs> <laughs> just messing around. Jen's gonna get you later. Don't worry. I'm ready. <laughs> just a sweet girl. Congratulations, by the way. I'm looking forward to the to the next mini Green Goblin attacking me many years from now. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's two of them, so. Oh wow! Congratulations, <laughs> Luke and Leia. Excellent. Exactly. <laughs> Those were my name suggestions. Yeah. Um. So, since we're on the topic of filmmaking, um, no budget filmmaking. Tell me what it is. Like we've talked to people who have budgets for their films, and some of them with big budgets for their films. So, <laughs> please just define what a no budget film is for me. Uh, to me, a no-budget film uh, is a couple things. Number one is all the crew members you think exist on a film no longer exist. You know, it's one to five people, tops. Um, it's paying for the movie in increments. You know, for us, it was we bought the equipment a year before, we paid for the movie during, and then post was the next section. So it, it was never like when people ask me the budget and, you know, I say or whatnot, it wasn't one large sum because they'll 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 be like oh you know especially where I come from they'll be like how did you do that and I'm like I don't know to be honest but it all comes <laughs> it all comes over time you know so it doesn't feel like a giant blow all at once. The other thing is you know obviously you are you know there's no it's all guerrilla style so when you see us on the beach that's just us pretty much showing up on the beach that day you know? <laughs> um, in every scene for the most part. I think the one location we paid for was the theater, you know, because we couldn't, you know, just show up at the theater and start shooting. <laughs> so it was, you know, you don't get to shoot, you know, in a regular movie where they shoot, you know, half a page in a day or even on a quote unquote independent film where they shoot maybe three pages, we would shoot 10 to 12. So there's a crunch of time, you know, involved. There's, You can't stay too long on anything. You have to move. And the other thing is you really have to, in my opinion, you have to deal with what's not going to work. And what I mean by that is no matter how hard you try, for the most part, especially for me, which is a first-time film, there are going to be technical flaws. There are going to be flaws where if we put it in front of, you know, a real cinematographer or a real sound audio guy, they're going to be like, "Mm." No, no, there's a there's a little bit of a, a thing there, or that shot's overexposed, or something, and you know you just gotta let that go because it's either you make this film or you don't. And in our case, and I would say this as strong as I can, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, I feel that too many people in the no budget world or the independent world, I should say, they focus on the look so much that they don't focus on story and characters. Because the fact of the matter is, it's been proven over and over again. If the audience cares about the characters, they could care less if it's not lit perfectly or if it doesn't sound perfectly. As long as they can hear what's being said, if they are emotionally invested in the characters, you're going to win. Overall, it has happened time and time again with big filmmakers on their first films where they now look back and say, 
wow, that's pretty bad from a technical standpoint. But for some <laughs> reason, the audience went along. So for us, I knew that that was what I felt were our strengths going into it. You know, as an actor for 15 years or, or whatnot, I felt very strongly I could get good acting performances out of my actors. And I felt the story was a little bit, you know, above, you know, what you would expect from an independent film. A lot above, if I'm, I'm trying to be humble. <laughs> but... <laughs> You know what I mean? I, I, I had done my work as a writer for over a decade. And, and so I felt like, OK, the only thing, the only thing professionally we have going into this is writing and acting. That's it. So this other stuff we're going to do as great as we can, as good as we can and make it. Gabriel, that's my partner, Gabriel Guy. It was me and him, a two man crew. We would constantly say, is this negligible? You know, is this uh, workable? You know, because there would be plenty of things that would come up on set that people don't know about that were serious problems. I mean, genuine, like, how the hell did you make that happen? I mean, like, I don't know, but we just kept saying, eh, is this feasible? Does it, is it negligible? That's, it's good enough, you know? Because neither one of us as perfectionists were going to be happy to the degree that we wanted to be, but we just had to accept that and move on. And that's a big thing for me. There's a big difference between, I, and I, don't, I, I hope this doesn't sound the wrong word to anyone listening out there the wrong way. I feel the word independent has been corrupted. <laughs> It's been corrupted by the studios as a way to sell tickets to people that want to feel that they're watching what they think is an authentic artistic expression. You know, the fact of the matter is, if you have a star in your film, I could care less if they're getting, you know, $100 a day, whatever the low budget is, because the fact of the matter is you have a star in your film. So now you're selling to markets before you even release the film. You're getting into festivals before you're even done. So I feel like that word you know, I guess by traditional definition, it means, you know, funding from any source other than a studio. And I understand that. But there's a vast difference between the $400,000 film, you know, starring, I'm not going to name names, but actors who have a built-in fan base and are well-known, and then our film, which is made for, you know, $20,000 starring no one you've ever heard of. It's a big difference. So I, I try to say we're a true indie because, you know, that's that's what we are. We're a bunch of, you know, I used to say... We're a bunch of pirates running around in the field with a camera because we just have to. And that's really what it is. We're all in our 30s, you know, for the most part. And it's it was kind of a desperation move in some ways. It was like, I'm not going to sit on the sidelines anymore. I want to tell the story I want to do. I think I can do it with this money. And if I don't, I'm going to find a way to make it work. I, I actually totally agree with you. Um, indie film, to me, I mean, coming from Vancouver where everyone is a fucking filmmaker, photographer, or model... Um, I think independent film is that. It is a bunch of dudes running around with cameras, you know, doing the whole filming filming wherever you can and, you know, the it's easier to beg forgiveness and ask permission kind of style. <laughs> you got it. You got it. <laughs> I mean, I'll give you I'll give you one example that I've talked about before and it's like this doesn't happen on a quote unquote independent film, but on a true indie it does. We so all our locations for the most part are gorilla, except for the stuff at Denny, who plays Son of Ghost Man, at at his house, which is probably the main location. So I knew for that week, well, we're good for that week. We can do whatever we want. You know, we're covered. And we go out to film the first day. And I, I, I wake up to this incredible racket, chainsaws. Okay, I love that, that video. One, this behind-the-scenes video is fucking awesome, by the way. It's all true. So I'm like, what is going on? So my neighbor had this, like, 100-year-old tree, and the roots were so deep within the ground, it was starting to push up the tile on his kitchen. So talk about a horror movie. Go ahead. Anyone that wants to take it, feel free. <laughs> Little Shop of Horrors, tree style. So they had been trying to get a permit from the city for, I don't know, six to eight months to, to be allowed to remove this tree because you can't just go out and do it. And it's a whole pain, bureaucratic nonsense. No idea. It happens to fall on the day that we're supposed to start shooting the week at my house. Now, for anyone that doesn't understand that, that means uh, jackhammers, chainsaws, literally nonstop from 8 in the morning till about 6 at night. So I live in Southern California, so there isn't a lot of uh, daylight uh, after 6 o'clock at that time <laughs> when we were shooting. So we, honest to God, were like, we'd wait 30 seconds and I'd have to guess, be like, okay, go, action. <laughs> and we'd get snippets in there. And there's still one scene in the film that I've never been totally happy with because we just... We had like 45 minutes to do it and, you know, I didn't, wasn't comfortable with, you know, a lot of the blocking and a lot of the shot selection. But I, you, there was nothing I can do. You know, people out there are like, well, why didn't you reshoot it? Well, because I had a friend who had grown a mustache, for one, 
And he has a real job. He can't have the mustache really on his job. So he had to shave that. It just wasn't going to happen. You can't have a mustache at your job? Well, he could, but I don't think it's conducive to the work he does, let's say. So, you know, it's it just was one of those things where reshoots were not – it was not an option. So we had to make it work, you know. But okay. that's the kind of stuff that happens on films like no, that. No, now I'm really curious. Where does somebody work that mustaches are not acceptable? There's many You don't have to tell that. me. No, no, I'm trying to, I'm going to, I'm going to make it up in my head. It's fine. It'll be funny. So, yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's, I mean, I think that's part of the, uh, the trials and, and stuff that you go through as an indie filmmaker, as a true, a quote unquote, true indie filmmaker is that you do have to deal with that kind of shit. Yeah. You know, cause well, people are going to fuck with you cause they don't care what you're doing. Absolutely not. Especially out in Los Angeles. They really don't care because everyone's doing it. And <laughs> if I was where I'm, I'm from Algonquin, Illinois, which my high school at one point was uh, in the middle of a cornfield. That's actually true. <laughs> you know, if I wanted to go film in the <laughs> there, every single person in town would be like, come on in, film, whatever you need. Would you like some food? <laughs> Whereas here they're like, I'm sorry, do you have like $8,000? Yeah. And you're like, no, no, I'm an independent film. They're like, oh, I know about independent films. You know? They're like, <laughs> well, see, that's the problem yet again. It's the so. same thing here in Vancouver. Every time you run down a street, it's like, I want to go to my favorite cafe, and there's a fucking film in it. Great. Yeah. Whatever, yeah. assholes. Yeah. yeah my, sorry, my boyfriend was in a is in a web series here that has a zero budget also. And uh, they were actually filming in my apartment because they needed an apartment to film in. <laughs> They're like, okay, yeah. we, need to, we need a rental property. I'm like, okay, I guess my place. So I had people stuffed in my bedroom with all their equipment. And, yeah. and, every, and every three minutes, a sky train would go by. So they had to, like, okay, we sit there waiting. The train would go by. Okay, go. And they'd film. And they'd film like them. Like, and, oh, there was a train in it. <laughs> yeah. And I was, I was in the middle of, uh, I was engaged. And uh, despite the film, we made it to the finish line. We're married. And, you know, I, I mean, imagine going to your wife. And she's not into, you know, the entertainment industry. And I was like, so look, I want to turn our entire house into a horror host set for like a month. How do you feel about that? You know, and you know, I just have the best friend, best wife in the world, and she was like, "Yeah, let's go for it." So you'd you'd wake up and you'd forget there's a horror host set as you're walking to get coffee, and you'd like trip over fake trees and just go. <laughs> you know, that's just what are you gonna do? You need it, you know. So, well, I'm glad you guys made it through. And she was your assistant director too, wasn't she? Uh, in some way, she was. Director's assistant. We always yeah. say, we always say it was a two man crew, and that's a little that's a little disingenuous to some degree. Uh, Gabriel and I did all the technical creative aspects. We we were in charge of all that. But every day on set, I want to say every day was his wife Sarah, who plays Renee in the film. She's great. She also did all the makeup for us because we were idiots and we're like, yeah, we'll do the makeup too. And then you realize, oh, that's like a three hour process, even just as a horror host. Uh, I gotta set up a shot, man. I gotta work. I gotta figure out aperture. So we had uh, her, and then my <laughs> wife was there every day, and then my sister-in-law Heather, and they were just amazing. Because again, I'm someone. I always joke that uh, my favorite character is Han Solo, and I'm always like Han Solo, just so confident and cocky, and and you know, yeah, we'll go through this asteroid field. I'll figure it out, no problem. And then halfway through, I realized, oh, I'm in way over my head here. I've got to figure this out. And I was just lucky to have people around who'd be like, did you want me to cook lunch today instead of you? Be like, you know what? I think that'd be great. <laughs> I got to figure out how this blood goes out of his arms. Cause we haven't thought about that. And we're shooting in an hour, you know, or whatever the case may be. That kind of sounds like how I run horror honeys, to be honest. <laughs> it seems a very dictator, dictator, you know, situation. But I'm not, well, all I know is I sucked up to the right person. You know what? It's a cat tatership here. So. <laughs> we can do a whole web series. <laughs> we'll write something up. It'll be like House of Cards with horror honeys <laughs> behind the scenes. And now there's two sci fi honeys. I can do a whole season on that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Um, okay. So I'm curious about. Um, so people who've talked to you in the past that are uh, independent and no budget filmmakers. They put aside a certain amount of money for film festivals and sending out screeners and all that kind of stuff. Do you guys have a plan for that? I don't know if you guys have been to any film festivals or anything at all. Okay. So here's the thing. We, you're going to make, everyone makes mistakes. <laughs> so <laughs> I was so excited to, you know, I'm a guy that my motor's always going. So I just wanted to get, let's go, let's go, let's do it. Let's do it. What's next? So 
we did a rough cut and we had a rough cut screening out here with, you know, I want to say like 200 of our friends. It was fabulous. It was wonderful. And I actually, some people would say, why'd you do that? I, I actually would recommend it to people because if you show it to three people or five people, I don't think you're going to get the consensus that you may need personally as an editor, as a director to make the decisions needed to make the film go forward. I'll just use an example. You know, if you were to give it to your first five critics, you know, and maybe one hated it, you might jump off a cliff and just, get, <laughs> oh, man, I don't know what to do. But if you put it out there for 200 people, you absolutely will get a consensus. You will know when the movie is long. You will know when those spots are funny. You will know what storylines are working because you can feel it palpable. It's in the air. You know, nobody has to fake laugh because they're, you know, 40 rows away. So we were really happy with the rough cut, and I just decided, I was like, oh, I'm going to submit festivals now as rough cuts, because they say you can. They say, oh, it's not a huge deal, so go ahead and do that. So I ignorantly did that, and, you know, they tell you not to do that, and I would, I would back that up now. Do not submit rough cuts to festivals, because the first festival we submitted to, obviously Sundance, like everyone does, because you live in a world of dreams, and you're like, well, you got to take this lottery ticket. <laughs> Which you do. By the way, that's, you know, of course it's one in a million, but that's the one, you know, go ahead. You know, my advice to independent filmmakers would be pick five to seven dreams and go for it. And then don't go to the other big ones because if you're unknown and they don't know you, it's, it's just, your chances are incredibly small. I was talking to a couple larger, I won't out them, but larger film festival programmers recently and got a lot of feedback. And, you know, they, they just said, look, if it's unknown and your chances are just so hard that it's going to get through that scrap heap, you know? So I submitted rough cuts and the, the first film Sundance to what we did towards the end, it was just a vast difference of the film, you know, not even like from a filmmaker, like, Oh, it's really different. And then you're like, no, it's not. It was, we had original music. We had cut 20 minutes out of it because of course, you know, I was like, Oh, let's have a five minute dance sequence. That sounds great. <laughs> Idiot. So, <laughs> I was like, oh, no, but I really want to draw out the romance. It's beautiful. So, you know, things like that, we cut it down. And um, so long story short, Kat, uh, I submitted to a lot of festivals, but it never was a complete project. By the time we got it to a finished state or close to it, there was a couple festivals left, and we got, we got really close to a couple big ones. One of them, I was like, no way are we getting into this. And they, they actually wrote me and were like, your movie's hilarious. We just can't fit it in. And it was a handwritten note, so it was great. But then I just decided I had a choice. I could either chase festivals and spend another year resubmitting to the same ones. They've already seen a rough cut or even newer ones or just put it out myself. And I personally, for me, made the decision to put it out because I do feel that I have friends that I love and admire and respect and I respect their work. And it's sitting on a shelf for five years because they've been chasing festivals for you know years because I think the dream in, in a lot of people's heads is oh, if I get into a festival, this will all – you know, my whole life will change. And really, festivals are fantastic, and they, they can grow your audience, and they can personally validate you. But, you know, for me, I just wanted to get the film out there. It was, it was an audience-friendly film. So I just was like, I made the decision to put it out. And so as it stands now, there's really not much we can do festival-wise because most festivals aren't going to take something that people can buy online right now. True. So true. there are some horror conventions and whatnot that people have talked to us about that we're considering. I just want to make sure, you know, I make the right decision going forward, mm -hmm. you know, especially that first one, like, okay, where do we want to put it the first time if we want to do this? And, you know, on top of it, I got horror hosts who have been, you know, emailing me and asking me if they can do a presentation of our film, which would make sense from a lot of, you know, angles, but oh, yeah. you know, I've got to weigh that too and not do that too soon. And, you know, mm -hmm. so that's where we stand with that. Okay, I think that's awesome. It also leads into my next question, which is about your Rondo Award nomination. Yeah. So, Rondo Awards, for those of you who do not know, uh, the Rondo Awards are honoring the best in classic horror research, creativity, and film preservation. Now, you're nominated for Best Independent Film. Yes, ma'am. And yes. I think this might be where some of your snarky comes from for other independent films that you are nominated with. Um, th that's not where it comes from, but it is fun, uh, to be kind of the film. I, there's probably a couple others that I, it does look like there are a couple others that are super, super independent yes. here, as well as one that, <clears throat> excuse me, is actually a little bit similar. There's another one with horror hosts in it. 
To some degree, yes. Um, it's it's very fun to uh, you know. I looked at all the films, all you know, great, and some of them I really want to check out just by titles alone. I mean, I'm like, wow, that's just a brilliant title for so many reasons. <laughs> and you know, to me, it was fun, you know, clicking on like their trailers or the websites and seeing their their trailer views. They'd be like, wow, they've had like 500,000 trailer views. Hey, but we're we're like right there at a thousand, so deal with that. <laughs> But it's kind of fun because I've always, I don't know if it's the way I was brought up or, you know, everyone, you know, I was always, I, I like the underdog situation. It's not even about a contest or anything, but I like, there's something within me that I think I'm best or I excel best when I feel like there's a chip on my shoulder, like, you know, all right, you don't know me. Well, I've worked at a catering company for many, many years, so I have many, many caterers. So let's see, you know, things like that. <laughs> Um, it's fun, you know. Um, I, I was pretty surprised and shocked by it. Uh, I believe I owe a lot of gratitude to the horror host community. Um, the first horror host that really, you know, gave us a shot and, and, and watched our film and really has been very helpful to us is a guy named Dr. Gangrene out of Nashville. Great horror host. Very lucid, very on top of his game, very funny. Really, really genuine guy that, that gave our film a shot, and he loved it. And I think that that started, you know, kind of the spread within the, the community of you should check this film out, blah, blah, blah. And then some people were, you know, pledging for us to get nominated, and, and it happened. And it was, a real, it was a real nice moment. You talk about validation and everything. You know, when you put together your, this film that you believe in, that I genuinely – like, I would not talk to – I, listen, I have been part of films that immediately when I saw it, I was like, oh, I can't, I can't tell people about it's out there's no way i mean in mean, the shame that takes over you when that happens is it's it's it can be incredibly creative crippling and depressing it really can when you when you do something and you're like oh that's that's just terrible but in this case i'm so proud of the film i, I really like it um i love it and so to get some small form of validation and to get more people kind of turning their heads and being like what what is this you know, it's really rewarding. And, and to me, as I said, because it's a voter system, it'd be great to win. But we got the nomination. To us, that was that was the win. Mm -hmm, it was like, definitely. hey, this thing exists. Maybe you should look at it. Elvira, you know, as an option. <laughs> just send her a copy. Just, like, just seriously yeah, exactly. send her a copy. Just a nice little handwritten note. Draw a couple of bats on it. She'll love it. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> All right, well, that's, that's it for my questions. I'm going to open it up to the other girls because I know there are a couple of other questions, burning questions in the wings. Burning. Burning. Who wants to do go first? Do we need first? to pick up the horror aspect? Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> I need some new horror movies to watch, girls. I'm struggling over here. I'm trying. <laughs> I've been renting a lot, and I'm just, oh, I don't know. It's tough. Really? Okay, well, does, yeah. I, does anybody have who? Sorry, Jen. I totally just cut you off. That was actually me. Oh, that was you. I'm sorry, Lenny. Go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, we don't always have the best luck either, so no, I'm not sure okay. Definitely how much help we can be. Um, so do you want me to ask my questions? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> um, I guess you actually brought up the music. Uh, my question is, I have a couple actually, but uh, the music in the movie, it kind of reminded me like of The Breakfast Club specifically, yes. kind of the new wavy synth pop sound. Right. Um, was that what you were thinking when you soundtracked it? Hundred percent, hundred percent, and and finding bands or artists that are into new wave was a challenge. I mean, unknown, you know, because ultimately, I have a lot of friends who are aspiring musicians, but they play a lot of rock, you know, a lot of alternative rock. I'd say, you know, stuff that sounds um, more '90s. Whereas I was looking really for a lot of '80s, obviously for the for the bulk of the stuff. And that was a challenge because you have friends you love and admire and respect their work, but it doesn't fit the tone of your film. And really, Gabriel was just uh, an unbelievable partner because he was in a band at the time. He's in another band now. So it was a really good bridge between uh, – I have so much respect for musicians that I struggle to talk to them sometimes. And <laughs> it's true. And I also have this big – Un, it's it's strange paranoia fear because of um, you know I'm, I'm a little bit of a taller guy and I'm aware of how I look and how I can talk so I'm always afraid they're just going to look at me and be like look at this frat guy walking down the street I'm not going <laughs> to talk to him. Counter cool. 
so Gabriel was a great bridge between the musicians and what I wanted, and he was able to talk to him and tell him what I was trying to do. And what was really wonderful was showing them pieces of the film before we used their film. Because I said to every, I was like, look, I want to make sure you want your music in my film. You know, if you're unhappy with it, that's going to sadden me. So I want you to see, you know, the film and see where I want to put it and what I want to do so you can understand the context. But it was definitely a strong new wave vibe for the whole. You know, there was a couple guys that really were the, were the MVPs. You know, the, the Kirk Gellerstead is a lifelong childhood friend. He's brilliant. This guy, you talk about range. Whatever song, whatever genre you need, he can do. He did the counter cool, like, glam metal rock song. And then he also did, like, the underlying um, romantic stuff. And then he also did a bunch of the, like, the opening credits and kind of the, the new wavy. I mean, that's quite a range to do all those different things. So he did that. And then um, the other one I'd want to point out is uh, Adam and Christina Fouth, who are Sherlock and Phyllis, a.k.a. Demon Child in the film. Okay. They, they wanted to be part of the film, and they were, they're very close with both me and Gabriel. Uh, actually, Adam's technically Gabriel's brother in some ways. So I was always worried, like, oh, man, I don't know. I, I'd really feel bad if I didn't like their stuff or it didn't work because they wanted to do it. And I, I couldn't say yes till I heard anything. And then Gabriel brought over the Son of Ghost Man theme song. And I was like, oh, my God, they totally get the car crash situation I want to do here with the music for the theme songs. Like, they get it. It was, it was supposed to be like Elaine and uh, the, the, the guys from the movie Swingers that play at the Dresden out here. You know, I forgot, I can't remember the name right off the top of my head. Elaine and Marty. Marty and Elaine, you know, where they're doing Saturday Night Fever. So it was mostly New Wave we wanted, though, for sure. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I really like the instrumentals. I thought that was, I, I really thought that really stood out. Oh, that's that's kind of what brought to mind the, uh, the Breakfast Club for me, where the, yeah. the instrumental interludes in it. So. I did want to have a scene where Contra Cool yells so loud, like a, like a window pane breaks. <laughs> uh, Emilio Estevez in the Breakfast Club, but it did deleted scenes, maybe. <laughs> That's a whole other disc. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, my other question was my my favorite scenes that in the movie were the ones where um, the hosting scenes, the Son yeah. of Ghost hosting scenes. I thought they were really personal, yeah. and they kind of struck me as being written by somebody that kind of knew what it was like to be an outsider. And I didn't know if that kind of lent itself to the story or if you had any background that led to that aspect of the film. Yeah. I mean, I could get, you know, fairly deep. I won't, I won't bore your <laughs> listeners. You know, the thing about the film that some people have picked up on is that it's an incredibly personal story to me. When, uh, Carlo gives the speech to Denny, you know, which is probably, in my opinion, the only real, you know, sort of dramatic scene in the movie. Maybe there's a couple of it, but that one's the big one to me. And he's talking about, you know, because because Denny's thinking about quitting this horror hosting and, and whatnot. And Carlo's like, look, man, I don't think you realize what your stuff matters. Like, this is who you are. You can't change this because, you know, you think you want money or status or, you know, stability on a certain level. You know, that's really... Uh, Carlo talking to me to some degree. You know, I have pursued writing and acting uh, for so long and felt, you know, it's a very difficult business. You know, I've had, I've been, you know, very fortunate and blessed to have some of the most amazing experiences, you know, of my life and things that other actors and whatnot are, are you know, fascinated by. And that's, that's awesome. But they still, it's still breaking through on a level where you do it for a full-time living is incredibly difficult. And it's, there's times at this age of my life where I do feel like an outsider. You know, I do feel like you know, the kid, and this is why it worked to me from a horror host standpoint, is we were, we were the kids no one wanted to play with. You know, everyone's playing over here in Hollywood, making all this stuff. We think we're just as good or capable, but they want nothing to do with us. So it just came a thing of, fine, we'll go, we'll go make our own sandbox over here. And people will come and watch us and want to play with us. So, you know, <laughs> you know, basically, fuck you. You know, whatever. Fine. You, don't want, you want to make another Adam Sandler terrible romantic comedy? Fine. I'll make this. <laughs> and, you know, what they don't realize is the channels are opening up where people are going to start recognizing stuff like that. So from the outsider standpoint, it was very personal to me. Um, you know, Denny is a very personal character to me. Um, 
and everything he goes through and the awkwardness and not knowing if he's doing it right, but still wanting to do it. You know, that was definitely, you know, very, very near and dear to my heart. And then the other thing was with those scenes, I was just so terrified of, I don't know, um, not doing justice to, you know, my hero Sven Gulli and other horror hosts out there. You know, that was a real strong, you know, I felt a lot of pressure to get that right. I didn't care if somebody who didn't know who a horror host was, and there's plenty of people that don't, if they didn't get those scenes and understand why there's crazy sound effects that come in or, you know, ridiculous, uh, you know, what a buffoonery, I didn't care. I wanted people that knew horror hosts to watch it and go, oh, my God. And, you know, there's nothing like when I get an email or, or somebody writes me and says, hey, man, I had a guy in, you know, whatever, Louisiana. It was just like this. You brought back memories of that guy and that fondness of that time. You know, there's a very nostalgic feel to my film, and it's pretty rewarding when that happens. But I certainly, you know, it, they were very personal, I guess. It's my own. I could go on for an hour. Sorry about that. <laughs> but they are very personal to me. So, so how did it feel to play kind of a douche canoe like Count Dracul? <laughs> like, so much you have... fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's so much fun. Yeah, it's so, it's just not – it's not hard because – I, Count Cool has no dramatic scenes, nor should he. You know, somebody said to me, like, I wanted to see a little bit deeper into Count Cool. I'm like, why? He's, <laughs> I, you know, that's not, I wanted him to be an 80s villain. That's it, period. And so for me, there was no pressure in that because, you know, I could just go, you know, I, I said to the, everyone on, on the set, I, I looked at it, not to sound pretentious, but everyone has different colors. There's a different line. Some people can go this far with the character, some can't. To me, Contra Cool is the apex. Like, you can go as buffoon as you want, and that's fine, as long as everyone else around you is kind of rooted in reality. So it was, it was difficult from a technical standpoint of, remember, we only have a two-man crew. So when I'm acting, somebody's got to be behind camera. So if I put Gabriel behind camera, he's stressed out because somebody else is doing audio. But if I have someone else behind camera, I'm stressed out. So that was challenging. But as far as actually, like, line readings and everything, that, that wasn't, you know, real difficult for me because... A lot of people don't understand how hard it is to be the leading man. You know, Devin, to be the guy that has to make you care for him and be in almost every scene, that role is so much harder than people realize. And I know from firsthand experience. And he's just so much better at it. So it was just like, oh, I get to basically fuck off and, and be an absolute <laughs> D-bag? That's easy for me. Which there's a lot of friends at home listening laughing right now. They're like, yeah, it's easy. <laughs> I channeled my, my older brother in that role is what I did. Nice. Is he aware of that? <laughs> he is now. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Nemesis Honey. Yes. <laughs> Sweet. Um, not to in in inject a little seriosity into it, but okay. So I was watching the movie, <laughs> and uh, I... And as a woman, I'm assuming that it's a romantic comedy that you're writing here, so it's aimed a lot at women because, or women that drag their boyfriends to said romantic comedy. Um, I was actually kind of surprised at how most of the women in your movie were treated. Um, the, you had a really strong lead female character, and she was great, I have to say. And uh, you, and her, uh, the way she was, you know, she she said, "Okay, well, I'm just going to walk away now a couple of times." You know what I mean? Like I thought that was really great, but really, all the other women in your fa in your film were kind of treated badly um the like the, the scene where uh what's his friend's name carlo um carlo. yeah he's by the pool and uh he's he has this girl there and he says yeah i don't know if she speaks english and she's like yes i do and and he goes yeah yeah go get in the pool and then he makes a comment about her ass kind of thing yeah. and I, I and i can appreciate that that is to show that he's a bit of a dick he is an idiot. Um, but and then but also by the pool your character um, those three girls were the three vampire chicks. About he's like, yeah, yeah, you guys go away now, kind yes. of thing. And, and then the third guy, the the old guy, the ghost man guy, um, starts talking about how yeah, this girl drew him a picture and he bent her over in the green room or something after she gave it to him. And you know, it just, I don't know. I think for a movie directed at a lot of women, um, I think that those three particular scenes could have been handled a little differently. Um, sure. Was that, was it written by you or by a male? Yeah, I, I wrote the film. Because uh, I'm just kind of, because uh, I, I understand that that's traditionally how a lot of um, men see th that type of, like, how, how, how do I explain it? Um, I think I know of, what you're saying, yeah. 
Yeah. So I think um, I understand w- what your motivations were and what you were trying to get across. If sure. those three characters were dickheads and it was by treating women badly that they exactly. were dickheads. I think it could have, I think if from a female perspective, I would have found the point better made if the women, like for example, the girl in the pool had said, you know, yeah, you're a dick and then left instead of taking right. it and saying, okay, I'll go to the pool. You know what I mean? Like I, sure. So, you know what I mean? So that was I do, yeah. I, like how did how did that yeah did you did anybody bring that up when you were writing no no um i mean not to uh, yeah i can either answer either one or not but for me you you basically said what i would say is with carlo's situation i just wanted to be ridiculous that you know he even has a girl that even talks to him and he's he's an idiot and i had hoped that the prism of those scenes would make people realize how much of an idiot those guys are, if that makes sense. Especially Count Dracul. I mean, he's a bad guy. You know, I mean, he's the villain of the film. So I think the, the I wanted to do my best to make uh, Claire, who's the lead, obviously, I felt this is going to be a difficult sell to make her as likable as I want her to be because of the fact that, you know, a lot of people probably are drawn to the goofier aspects of the film. And she represents, to me, symbolically, the real world. So I felt going into it, that was going to be a challenge to make her likable on the level I want. Because to me, this makes, I don't know, surprise or whatnot. I am also very, I, I, want, I don't want a, a female character, especially a lead, to be the typical cardboard cutout. I hate that. I think that's just terrible. So anything I could do to deflect that and make her seem uh, the character that I envisioned, which is more depth, was what I was going to, what I was going to do. It's the same way at the top of the movie, uh, Renee, you know, dumps Denny for the reason she, she did. She's clearly in control there. I don't think anyone would, you know, dispute that. You know, she dumps him. And quite frankly, I think it's for very valid reasons, you know. Um, so I was making it clear that, you know, she was in control there from that woman's standpoint. Um, but then it's interesting. Yes, yeah, she becomes the, you know, the one of the vampires later in the movie. Spoiler alert. But because I think things are filled with depth on that level. You, do you know what I'm trying to say by that? Like you can be so much, whether you're female or male, you can, you can have one in a power situation. You can be so much in control in one situation and then another you're completely different. And I think we've all been in those situations, male or female. So, you know, the other stuff is really just, you know, especially like with some of the guy conversations. What I don't want to do is – go away from what conversations do happen at times, if that makes sense. I think if you do that, you do a disservice. So I think if you can show it in a way that shows, as you, to me, caught it, like, these guys are idiots. That's what I want. I want Denny to be as likable as possible. Denny and Claire, my two leads. So the more someone is an idiot, the more Dracul is a buffoon, however it was, you know, and maybe I could have handled it differently. The more I can do that, the more it innately makes you care about those other two characters. You know, that, that, I guess that's my only, you know, response to that would be, you know, I, I would never want anyone to think there was any disrespect in Fennec. That's, you know, that's one of my main goals is to be, you know, um, is to get women right, you know, leads and, and things of that nature, which I don't think, you know, I, anyone does on, on, on the level that's uh, a male, but I try very hard, you know, and those conversations I had often with, you know, Angela on set who plays Claire is like, what do you think about this scene? Is this, is this good? And again, going back to that's why she never says she's in love with him. Never happens because that's insane. Why would she be in love with him? You know, you know, so to I me, it was... like, and I thought she was very well done. Like I thought her character was really well written. <laughs> Thankfully. And, and, you know, <laughs> yeah, no, she, well, no, she, she really was and her, she yeah. acted really well. Um, I would, I, really well. Like I, I just thought it like it, it almost seemed like a couple of times I had the thought that it kind of seemed like the movie had a Madonna horror complex. A little right. bit like there's one girl that she's awesome and really I'd, I'd be her i was thinking a couple of times hey i'd be her friend i totally oh, her friend. you know and to be honest that is a that makes me feel so great because it was I, i'm telling you there was laborious conversations about like i was so terrified of like i said the the the, the horror host world innately people are going to be drawn to so it was like i i can't I can't make this person who represents the real world. Like we really have to fill her with as much depth as possible because I don't want it to be, because otherwise the audience is going to turn on her. You know what I mean? So that's why, you know, to me, 
again, she's, she's in control of the whole relationship, the whole movie, from, from minute one to the end. Even if she likes him, it doesn't matter. She's, she's in control. And I thought that that would... It, it's a tricky move because you also want to make your male... Um, you male likable as well. I will tell you that since the film, there has been thoughts, and it's adjusted my writing uh, completely. It's so like, oh, you know what? It, you know, I would never change anything I did about this film, so I don't want anyone to misinterpret. But it's like, what if, what if the ghost man character would have been a female? That would have that might have been more interesting. You know, that would have been cool. Like instead of the protagonist being a male. Because that's, you know, all I know from that standpoint. Be, oh, it should have been interesting. What if it was a girl instead? That would have been cool. So, you know, all I can say is, um, you know, I, 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 I do my best at those things while still keeping it real. And I'm, I'll say I'm glad you, you caught that those people were supposed to be buffoons in those scenes. I did, yeah. I, I think it was mostly because one of the reasons why our site exists is because getting a female perspective on horror movies in particular, I think, is valuable because as women we see things in horror movies that a lot of male reviewers don't see because we see it from a female point of view like i got i did i reviewed riddick for example and the male reviews i ever i read were like yeah lots of action whatever but they didn't catch that you know there were like a couple of rapes a bunch of attempted rapes you know right. women were used to boobs you know what i mean like sure. we, women tend to see that stuff and guys don't right a lot of times yeah. they're so good and it's it's traditionally been like the genre of horror in, of course, as a whole. yeah, totally agree with you. Yeah, uh, t- treats women as boobs and whatever. Which so is funny. I, think- I had one of the most offensive comments come from a friend, and we got in a slight argument about it. You know, he said, oh, yeah, your movie's great. It's very 80s homage, but you, you need to show boobs. And I was just like, <laughs> I was, and, you know, and I tried to, like, engage in a discourse that was somewhat intelligent. Like, why, though? Why would I need that? And, I mean, this person was, like, adamant, and I was just like, there's no reason that that would ever be in that film. I don't, I don't understand why I would do that. You know, and they're like, well, it just gets more people to watch or something. I'm like, well, I don't, if it doesn't make sense, doesn't, you know, make sense. So yeah, I, I from a male standpoint, all, all I can say is, uh, I, I assure you, I, I do everything I can to try to, um, to showcase females in a different light when I'm writing them. But this is a good point, at least about the, the minor scenes that, you know, is noted. Nemesis, honey, are you satisfied? I am indeed. That was an excellent answer. Excellent. Yeah, no, I mean, and I really mean it from my heart. You know, I, my wife, we watch, uh, we watch girls, right? And I got a lot of guys that, and I talk about, I've talked about this on my podcast, so this isn't like I'm bringing it up right now. I'm fascinated with the show because I, I don't, I can't relate, but Obviously, it strikes a chord with a certain segment of the population. Whether we agree with it or not, it certainly does. So I'm always just fascinated to watch it. And relate. What's that? You're not the only one that can't relate. Yeah, I'm but either that way, I it, does, it does represent a certain segment of the population, which I find interesting. I will say, whether you like it or not, I do find it interesting. I have a lot of male friends who it seems like to me, and I've brought this up to them. I've taken them to test. Their criticism, which... It isn't that the show isn't uh, worthy of criticism. Don't misinterpret. But it seems misogynistic to me at times. I'm like, well, what don't, what don't you like about it exactly? You know, and, and I've said, you know, it sounds a little like you just don't like it because it's females who are popular and, and running this show. It seems like you have a, a personal issue at stake there. And it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me, you know. You know, Kate Blanchett said it best on the Oscars. You know, the film, is the, the world is round, people. So, <laughs> so anyways, that, that would be my answer to it, so. No, I think I think that's great. I mean, we get just to backtrack to the boobs thing. We get a lot of comments, actually less so now than we did when we were starting out. But that our site needs more boobs. Yeah, you know, like there needs to be photos of us tits out all over the place or something. Which, by the way, can I just say it's it's pretty funny that it's pretty ridiculous that that's what they're asking for on your site. If you really want to see those things, it's really not hard to find somewhere. <laughs> you know. It's, it's, but having boobs next to horror, I mean, that's totally yeah. different. I mean, maybe yeah. maybe that's what would have pumped the film up to like being accepted more as a horror film and less of a yeah. romantic comedy with a horror frame. You no know, horror, horror. We gotta flip that on and switch somehow. Horror in some way. We get some fresh <laughs> ideas there. I think that's just me. Oh my goodness! Well, Kurt, my dear, I'm actually gonna start to wrap things up here. Yeah. Um. So I'll let you do any shout-outs that you want to do. Right. Um. Yeah. So. 
if people want to check out the film, uh, www.sun... Well, like I have to say www. Come on. <laughs> Sonofghostman.com is the website, and they can see the trailer right on the front page. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on Amazon Instant Video. You can get it on Vimeo. It's like $3. And, you know, I, I podcast every week on Stay Cool Geek with my partner, Kelly Dolan, who's often referred to the Horror Honeys as the <clears throat> Care Bears of the Horror World. <laughs> I promise you we'll be discussing you tomorrow. <laughs> okay, I want to approach this Care Bears of Horror thing. <laughs> yeah. I gotta, I, listen, I have to defend him. He's my guy. He's like, you know. I know. And you know what? When I, when I first saw that, when I was first tagged in that status, I was like, what the fuck is that about? Because we're chicks, we're like soft and fluffy and shit. But then I was like, wait a minute. No, no, no. If we have like little stabby icons on our tummies, then it, technically we can shoot knives at people. So right. I'm actually kind of okay with it now. Sure, sure. Because yeah. after some naming uh, I, I would don't occur. Think he, you know, it's one of those things, even back to Jen's question to some degree, and maybe they, he should, I don't think he even thought about it from that scenario. I'm sure not. He was just like, oh, they have different powers. What's the first thing I can think of? Care Bear. Care Bear. <laughs> Course. And and to be fair, I got you. You know, uh, you know. He was yeah. No, I'm, was, I'm not uh, arguing. He was defending his his host. Is all I can. <laughs> no, I I totally I totally get it. <laughs> Absolutely, it's just Monster funny. Squad. I let the record be known. I said Monster Squad. So. <laughs> I'm fine with that too. That's yeah. totally okay. <laughs> so yeah, we podcast every week. Stay cool, geek, and we talk about a lot of the stuff we probably touched on today, which is. Uh, trying to be creative in a world that it's difficult to do that. And and really, uh, I am an idiot in general, so I'm trying to learn how to become a, a husband and a man of some sort that still likes action <laughs> figures, if that's possible. That, that's not a thing. So we talk about those things. <laughs> that, uh, you know, we also talk about geek stuff. Well, if you ever want female Star Wars perspective, let me know, and I'll come on and talk Star Wars for hours. Okay, I will. <laughs> I will do that. All right. Yeah, comics. We do all these things. Excellent. Okay, so do you have a, a link for Stay Cool Geek? Are you on Podomatic or Podbean or anything like that? It's on iTunes, and it okay. is under StayCoolGeek.com, which is, you know, you can just go to my website too, KurtEdwardLarson.com, K-U-R-T, awesome. Edward, and Larson, L-A-R-S-O-N. And the other thing is if people want to vote for the Rondo Award, you know, uh, underdogs are cool, is all I'd say. <laughs> and uh, Sven Gulli uh, recommends us. So there you go. Excellent. And I'll be putting links to all of these things into the uh, the YouTube post I do and onto our Podomatic site as well. Um, so, ladies, any final words before we do our final shit? Um, I actually intend to buy this movie soon because I, I watched it again today and remembered how much I enjoyed it. So uh, I know Nemesis Honey doesn't share my opinions, but I quite enjoy it. So Look, there has to be one. Savvy points. There's always one. There, I, I would feel bad if there wasn't one. I would be like, okay, something's wrong. This isn't right. But that's okay. I, I was I was worried. Yeah, I like that there's one. There needs to be one nemesis in the world. So even if secretly, like I make another film and, and, and Sci-Fi Honey secretly is like, I love this film. This is unbelievable. Jim Caviezel and this guy, it's great. I don't want you to admit it. Please don't. That will ruin the whole the whole dynamic, man. It's no good. <laughs> a lot of it was very well done. <laughs> Don't feel bad, Jen. Own it. Own it. Yeah, it was. I. I it was fine. I, I think you know. I handle it with uh, grace and fun. I don't. You know, people who get upset about that stuff, filmmakers, they're they're in the wrong business. You know. <laughs> Yeah, I've I've gone on several rants about people that get butt hurt about criticism for their films. So, well, the, the thing to me is with criticism, it's always appreciated when it's from you know an intelligent point of view. You know, I would only say to any critics in general, and I try to do this on my podcast as well, is there's no intelligent discourse if you're just like it sucks. Well, what don't you like about it? You know, you need to explain. You know, not you. I'm just saying in general points of view. No, in general. You know, the more you can articulate it and say what you didn't like about it, I think especially with anyone doing anything public talking about it, it brings you more listeners. It brings you more of a following if you can, you know, intelligently back up your reasoning for not liking things, you know? I totally agree. Sometimes things just suck. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but there always has to be a reason. There does. You, you, yeah, absolutely. All right, Kurt. I feel like you could talk forever, and we probably could too, but I'm going to cut you off. 
Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> but don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. So um, you can find Horror Honey Radio on Podomatic, on Stitcher, on Radio Fubar. You can also find us on our website at thehorrorhoneys.com, including our multi-honey review of Son of Ghost Man. Um, I'd like to thank Matt, our producer, Honey, for once again babysitting us through this process. Thank you so much. Um, and Linny, where can people find you? I am at Linny Lou Who, L-I-N-N-I-E-L-O-O-W-H-O. And Jen, where can we find you until June? Surprisingly not at Nemesis, Honey. Um, <laughs> at uh, Jen Spacey. Awesome. J-E-N-S-P-A-C-E-Y, like Kevin Spacey. Oh, excellent. We love Kevin Spacey. Um, you can find Son of Ghost Men on the Twitters as well. They are quite lovely to chat with. You can find them at Son of Ghost Men. And you can find Kurt on there as well. Kurt, can we have your Twitter handle? Yeah, it's Kurt Edward L. K-U-R-T Edward L. Perfect. All right. So, everybody, we're going to say goodbye all together. So, ready? One, two, three. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> I love to take my baby to a movie show So I can try to suit you while the lights are low but you won't cuddle do a story of romance There's only one way I've got a chance It takes the Batman, Wolfman, Frankenstein or Dracula To put her in the mood for love It takes the cat girl, dog boy, creature from the Black Lagoon